I'm Dr. Daniel Cross-Turner, and I'm Head of Programming and Outreach for the Georgetown County Library System, and welcome to the library series of excellent online programs where we're celebrating South Carolina's deep and diverse food traditions. We call it From Blue Hills to Green Sea, representing South Carolina foodways. So we'll be going from the Piedmont in the mountains up in the corner of the state all the way down to the low country here, uh, the coastal plain. And all the while, we'll be examining what make South Carolina food traditions and dishes so unique uh, and engaging, and how those food traditions reflect deeper currents of cultural history uh, and identity. Right. We're grateful for the support of South Carolina Humanities in this endeavor, as well as our friends of the Georgetown Library and friends of the Waccamaw Library. And we have a, an excellent uh, scholar, one of the most prominent scholars of foodway uh, studies uh, with us today, who's going to uh, give a, a, an excellent talk. This is Dr. David S. Shields, and he is Carolina Distinguished F Professor at the University of South Carolina up in Columbia. He has also served as chairman of the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation. He is one of the leading scholars of the historical significance of Southern cuisine, and Dr. Shields speaks particularly to signature foods of South Carolina and how these have contributed to the development of our regional and national cuisines. Among many other publications, Dr. Shields is author of the Tour de Force Study of Southern Food entitled Southern Provisions, the Creation and Revival of a Cuisine from the University of Chicago Press. And he is also co-author with Chef Kevin Mitchell of Taste the South, South Carolina's Signature Foods, Recipes, and Their Stories. Uh, that'll be forthcoming from the University of South Carolina Press uh, this summer. So keep a, an eye out for that. Um, the Southern Foodways Alliance awarded Dr. Shields the Ruth Fertile Keeper of the Flame Award in 2016. So here with us, Dr. David S. Shields, uh, talking about South Carolina signature foods and their significance. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, David Shields, uh, and I'm going to start off today's um, presentations here in Georgetown by talking about some of South Carolina's signature foods. Here you'll see uh, a number of items that are um, among the 35 signature um, ingredients that was brought back in the past 15 years by the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation. Uh, I want to mention that because uh, I'm the chairman of the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation. I'm also the uh, Carolina Distinguished Professor at the University of South Carolina and the uh, chairman of Slow Foods Arc of Taste for the South. Uh, I've done a, a fair amount of work in um, food studies, particularly regional food studies. And you can see three books here. Uh, the first one, Southern Provisions, The Creation of Revival and Revival of a Cuisine is about the rise and, and fall and revival of uh, low country cooking. The Culinarians, the one in the middle is uh, a book which collects 175 life stories of uh, American caterers, restaurateurs, and chefs uh, from the very first restaurant in uh, Boston in 1793 to um, the crash of the restaurant world with prohibition in 1919. Um, there had never been uh, a collection of the life stories of great American chefs, so I thought uh, it was about time. Finally, uh, here is Taste the State, which is probably the book that's most uh, germane to our topic today. Uh, you'll see that uh, my friend Kevin Mitchell and I uh, have done a collaboration here talking about 
South Carolina signature foods recipes and their stories. There are 85 entries in this. And um, the problem now is that I only have 45 minutes and we can't possibly cover 85 different uh, dishes or ingredients in that time, nor would we want to. Uh, and so I'm going to concentrate on those uh, categories of food, which actually in terms of global nutrition are most important. And uh, that is grains. Uh, as many of you may know, maize, wheat, and rice supply 60% of the world's calories. Um, these are the staples, the building blocks of the global system. And cereals, grains um, have a really significant story in South Carolina. Um, I think that uh, if you take a look at uh, the history of planting or the history of uh, the development of something like baking, uh, you'll, you'll find uh, some wonderful backstories here. So one of my claims is that South Carolina has a distinctive approach to each of these items. Uh, for instance, in terms of maize, um, at the time of settlement, uh, uh, several native nations were occupying the territory that came to be South Carolina and they grew different things. Um, the Cherokee in the West uh, grew a variety of, uh, of gourd seed, uh, flower corns, uh, popcorns, and flint corns. Uh, but in terms of uh, South Carolina's subsequent history, in, in terms of the settlers, um, there were uh, two corns that really mattered. Uh, one was uh, a, a white flint corn, and the other one was uh, a white gourd seed corn. And in the 1830s, they crossed those corns and created a new category of corn called the dent corn, so-called because of the little indentation that makes the corn kernels look like a molar. In terms of wheat, um, originally uh, they imported hard wheat from Madeira and, and later Sicily uh, into our region. And um, then after the um, American Revolution, when farmers in Virginia had a revolution in terms of grain breeding and created uh, the soft white winter wheats, purple straw, white may, and red may wheat in the 1790s, we had the basis for the distinctive biscuit, cake, and whiskey uh, culture of the region. So um, two types of wheat, hard and, and uh, soft. Finally, uh, the story of rice, uh, um, Judith Carney, I'm, I'm sure has gone into this in tremendous uh, detail. And I'll just make uh, a number of supplementary points about this. Um, the original rice that uh, was planted as a crop by planters was a white tropical Japonica rice, Madagascar rice. And, and this was on the landscape from the 1690s to 1680s. And then that was succeeded after the American Revolution disrupted uh, the seed production of that rice by Carolina gold, which um, was the commodity rice from the 1790s to the 1920s, and then it was revived. There were also the patch-grown African glabarima rices. Uh, these included upland rices uh, and, and low, low country West African low country rices uh, that were patch grown. Um, and then uh, at the end of the 18th century, there was a <clears throat> particular upland rice, uh, which was here called red bearded rice. Uh, in Trinidad, it's called hill rice uh, that uh, was planted um, by small farmers and um, African Americans 
in the very beginning of the 19th century, and then later in the 19th century, there was another upland rice uh, that came from the West Indies called gopher rice. And we'll talk about that. So one of the things which I think is really interesting about corn is that um, in the eyes of other states, um, South Carolina was considered to be the home origination point for hominy grits. Now, hominy grits, of course, were a native preparation. And um, what happened was that the natives lye processed corn. And they did this because uh, if you eat corn as a staple of your diet um, and it's at every meal, you will suffer a, a niacin deficiency. This is called pellagra. So one way to uh, disrupt this problem is to lye process the corn and um, the issues with niacin are, uh, are taken care of. So um, these um, um, corn was uh, treated in ashes, uh, the basis for the lye, dried down and uh, the um, reconstituted and it was also ground. Um, and it was this ground form, which was either called small hominy um, or grits that became a kind of export commodity in the 1820s and 30s. And this little um, blurb that we see uh, from the Alexandria uh, Gazette of the 18. 40s, I believe, 1840 exactly, um, calls it Charleston grits uh, or small hominy. And um, um, so the identification uh, with this area, with the actual development of a, a market for ground uh, lye treated um, corn was, um, was something that you know, was antebellum established as a, a national, a national commercial resource. Now, the type of corn that was processed for grits was um, white flint corn, Sea Island white flint corn. This was a native land race that developed along the coast from central North Carolina down to Florida. Um, the strain survived uh, in, in South Carolina. It also survives in Florida. It was taken over in, a, in the middle of the um, 19th century when Americans were entering corns in European exhibitions and it won prizes in, um, in France. And so there are strains of um, of white flint corn descended from this corn that are grown in Italy and uh, in parts of France to this very day. But for the 19th century, uh, this variety of, of corn, this white, um, densely starchy, a round kerneled variety with eight to maybe 10 rows per cob was um, was the standard. Um, there was another flint corn that was grown, uh, and this is uh, Guinea flint. And you'll see that it's about the size of a dollar bill in terms of its ears, a smaller type of ear than the Sea Island white flint. And the story with this corn is, is interesting. Um, it descends from a, a West Indian corn called uh, uh, 
uh, coastal tropical corn. And there are two forms of it that uh, are now found in the South. One in Louisiana is uh, yellow Creole corn, which is the basis of all of the uh, Louisiana corn, fried corn mush and the kush kush recipes of the Cajuns and the uh, morning yellow grits uh, of New Orleans. In, in the Southeast, it was bred uh, by a certain African farmers um, to be a prolific corn. Uh, most corn sets one ear per stalk. It's a land race, sometimes two. Pro prolific corns have two corns as a base and can grow up as up to as many as five to seven ears per stalk. Uh, and this uh, Sea Island Guinea plant was selected for being prolific by uh, these uh, African-American or African um, uh, growers and made into a prolific form, um, different than the yellow Creole corn. And uh, there was a tradition of using this for, um, for grits and, and meal uh, in the Gullah Geechee uh, population along the coast. Um, this is really high in carotene uh, and uh, wonderful tasting. Uh, Marsh Hen Mill um, provides it as a grits corn now, so you can buy and secure it uh, uh, if you so choose. Beautiful corn to look at. As I said, in, in the 1830s, uh, there was um, a crossing of these corns that various uh, planters undertook. This was not a, a native development. And in Virginia, uh, John Hartwell Cock of Bremo Plantation, he was a friend of Thomas Jefferson. He belonged to the Albemarle Agricultural Society, the famous West, Western Virginia um, group that engaged in experimental agriculture. Anyway, he uh, crossed uh, a Virginia white flint corn called rare ripe with uh, the white gourd seed corns and created Cox prolific corn. And you can see the size of that, um, that ear. That's maybe 18 inches long. And there was invariably two and often more ears per stalk. This corn variety was grown throughout the South in the 19th century uh, and was offered by seed companies, Hastings out of Georgia, into the 1930s. And then it disappeared. And over the course of the last part of the 20th century, it became virtually extinct, except for that gentleman that you see in the middle picture there. Uh, Manning Farmer of Landrum, South Carolina, started growing this corn because his uncle grew it in the 1930s. He started growing it immediately after World War II. And he maintained the integrity and purity of the corn by growing it away from other pollinators and in 2017, Angie Lovezzo of So True Seed and I um, went to visit him because I had been looking for this corn for the better part of a decade. And there he had it. And since 2017, it was on the week before Thanksgiving, uh, Manning Farmer has sold his corn for seed uh, around the United States. It's being grown from Maine to Arizona. And one of the place, places it's being grown is um, Monticello. And the picture that you see 
of the woman looking up at the tall corn plants uh, is uh, is the uh, kitchen garden at Monticello on the terrace there, and that's Pat Bradowski, the vegetable farmer then. Because of uh, Cox's connection with Thomas Jefferson, it was thought an appropriate corn to grow. You'll notice the height of that corn. Many of the early corn varieties um, put out extensive foliage and grow extraordinarily tall. It's one of the signatures. The quality of the meal is wonderful. And uh, spoon bread made from uh, Cox White Prolific uh, meal, tremendous. The other corn that we should think about in terms of South Carolina is a hooch corn. Uh, this is a descendant of uh, an Appalachian red uh, corn. It was called master corn, and it was made a dent corn too sometime in the early 19th century. And after the Civil War, uh, it began being planted uh, in James Island and John's Island. And uh, it was a um, group of Gullah um, cultivators that started making uh, uh, corn whiskey out of it uh, called scrap iron. And um, when higher wire distillery uh, set up in Charleston a number of years ago, it was looking for an heirloom corn variety that it could use for its bourbon. He approached uh, Glenn Roberts and Glenn Roberts drew attention to this corn, which had been saved by the seed saver, Ted Schooning. And um, this led to a tremendous revival of Jimmy Red corn. Uh, the bourbon that High Wire made from it uh, became famous. And there you see the famous signature jug of the early releases. Um, there. Um, white dog, that is the, uh, the white liquor that comes out of the initial ferment, had so much flavor that uh, it tasted like a um, bourbon variety that had been in the cask for four years or so. Jimmy Red Corn also was taken up by um, um, a number of mills, uh, Marshan Mill, uh, Anson Mills, uh, mills up in North Carolina now for grits. And for the last 10 years or so, Jimmy Grant Red Grits have been seen on restaurant menus throughout the South. So what was originally a signature liquor corn for South Carolina became uh, a new form of grits. Um, for a long time, South Carolina only ate white corn grits. Middle of the 20th century, when groceries began stocking um, yellow corn belt uh, dent corn, I mean, dent corn meals in their cornbread mixes, uh, people began doing yellow cornbread. Or if uh, you were using guinea flint corn, there was that Gullah Geechee yellow corn bread. Then finally, in the 21st century, we have uh, the red corn grits from Jimmy Red dead corn. Number of farmers growing this across South Carolina now. Wheat uh, is a much more interesting um, plant. Uh, it uh, Europeans thought of bread as being the staple of their diet. So when they came and started planting the wheat that they had planted in North Europe uh, along the coast here, well, they found that that wheat would not grow. Uh, it failed uh, repeatedly. Diseases, um, day length issues, uh, caused problems. So in the very early part of 
the 18th century in the 1700 to 1710, 20 period, people began thinking along the latitude lines. What sorts of wheat are grown closer to the latitude of South Carolina? And um, they uh, hit upon the island of Madeira where there were a number of old wheat uh, varieties grown there. And these were Durham wheats. Um, these are hard wheats, um, which in the Mediterranean are used for pasta and also for bread. Uh, so these were planted. Um, and here we have a little snippet from Catesby, uh, who was here in the 1720s, uh, talking about it. Uh, that which is propagated in Carolina came first from the Madeira Island, none being found so agreeable to this country, it lying in a particular latitude. Grain has a thinner coat and yields more flour than that of England. Um, the upper parts of the country distant from the sea is said to produce it as well as in Virginia. But as there uh, are hitherto but few people set it, settled in those distant parts, little else has yet been planted but Indian corn and rice for exportation. Uh, wheat is sown in March and reaped in June. Uh, so a quick crop. Um, The greatest millers in colonial uh, southern colonies were the Salzburgers, a religious community that came out of the Austrian uh, area around Salzburg uh, and settled in the uh, territory uh, outside of Savannah called Ebenezer. And they too thought latitudinally uh, and they erected three mills. Uh, one of them was a lumber mill. Uh, one was a toll mill and another one was a grain mill. And here they are depicted along uh, an estuary of the, of the Savannah River. Um, and um, they remembered that in um, Roman mythology, the goddess of cereals, Ceres, was reputed to have been born on the island of Sicily. So they used their religious networks in Europe to secure wheat from Sicily, and they planted it. And they were extraordinarily successful with it. The type of wheat that they planted was called tamilia. And you can see it there with tamilia flower, that sort of uh, cream colored flower. And it was this flower that was used in the 1790s by a Charleston um, pasta maker, confectioner, and chef named Angelo Santi to make the first mac and cheese uh, in uh, South Carolina. The cheese that he used was Parmesan. Uh, and one of the great problems of making mac and cheese is that uh, dairies uh, had a problem with refrigeration in South Carolina for a long time. So most of the cheese and butter uh, that was consumed in South Carolina until later in the 19th century came from New York. Now today, we've restored Tamilia. Um, Dr. Rick Boyles is growing it in Clemson's PD station, seed for distribution. And uh, cheesemakers have popped up in the last 10 years as part of the artisanal uh, cheesemaking movement. So for the first time in a long time, both the Mac and the cheese 
can be locally sourced um, and uh, combined to be the signature Southern dish that it has been for a long time. Now, um, there were a category of Northern European wheats that were used for communion bread, that made very white flour. And they were grown in the summer in Europe, but they could not grow um, in the summer here. They were uh, subject to disease, to insect infestation. And the two earliest types of wheat uh, were white lamas and red, or sometimes it was called yellow lamas. And I've shown pictures, both survive in, uh, in England and in France. Uh, they did not survive on the South Carolina countryside. They kept on being planted and they kept on dying. But in the 1790s, a group of uh, farmers in Virginia uh, who found that uh, their markets for the old colonial commodities of tobacco uh, and, uh, and Indian corn were drying up, turned to wheat. And for the first time, wheat began being produced in large numbers. Um, but the American Revolution, uh, besides changing the market dynamics, introduced a terrible pest onto the countryside. It was called Hessian fly. It was believed to come in on the straw that was used as bedding for Hessian soldiers. And the Hessian fly had a very uh, regular uh, hatching cycle. And uh, if your wheat came to maturity before, uh, after June 12, the Hessian fly would destroy it. So there was a great um, demand for the creation of wheats that would be fully mature prior to that date. These were winter wheats, they were called, uh, and um, the first of them uh, was white May wheat, called May because it hatched, I mean, it, uh, it uh, matured and could be harvested in May before the Hessian fly hatched. Uh, and this particular wheat uh, in the early 19th century became, uh, you know, the first really important um, uh, biscuit and cake wheat uh, in the coastal south. It, however, began to suffer genetic collapse in the 1830s and 40s. But it survived when it was taken out to Fort Vancouver in the 18 teens and flourished out in the Pacific uh, Northwest. And USDA plant hunters found it in early 20th century, put it in the USDA small grains um, archive, and um, it was rediscovered um, recently and restored to the Pacific Northwest. And when uh, we heard that that happened, uh, Glenn Roberts uh, secured um, plots and it began to be grown here again. Um, and it makes a wonderful, really white um, uh, biscuit flour that uh, is, is superb. But the wheat that uh, really mattered um, for the long haul was a, a, another Virginia variety called purple straw. Called purple straw because it looks kind of bluish in, the, in its stalks. And here's Glenn in the midst of a, a crop of purple straw wheat. Uh, this was grown in large quantities, um, sometimes under the name blue stem, 
throughout the South until the 1970s. It had the shortest time uh, from sprout to maturation of any weed. And what's interesting is that the genetics of purple straw is found in every uh, large scale uh, cultivar, modern bred cultivar of Southern white winter wheat. It, ha it has provided the genetic uh, backbone of the entire biscuit, cake and whiskey uh, flour production in the South. And the flavor of purple straw is exceptional. Uh, there are numbers of people growing it now. Indeed, the demand for it is so great that we can't supply seed enough for it. And uh, one of the projects of the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation is to um, develop a kind of seed foundation that would um, supply enough seeds so that you can taste what the original um, uh, biscuit flour of our region is like, or taste an old style weeded whiskey. South Carolina, of course, is famous for rice. And it has to be said that um, the earliest forms of rice that were grown here, the Madagascar white rice that was brought in at the end of the 17th century, which was a, probably a subtropical Japonica, judging from the oldest rices that have been collected on Madagascar. Um, that variety did not survive the American Revolution long. Revolution disrupted the seed production and uh, it was supplanted by what was called gold seed rice in the 1780s and 90s. That was Carolina gold. There was also um, African uh, glabarima rices, which are patch cultivated and these were seen by Catesby in the 1720s. But there's a problem with growing, growing glabarima rice in, in North America. The day length issues are such that uh, it just doesn't thrive. Uh, and USDA sci scientists have been attempting to grow multiple lines of glabarimas for years. And that picture that you see on this slide is the only Glabarima variety that we have found that is capable of growing and sustaining itself uh, this far uh, north in latitude of, um, of the west coast of Africa where the original Glabarima rices came from. So one of the things which has always puzzled um, biologists and ethnobotanists is why given the survival of so many African diaspora crops uh, from Bene to uh, finger millet to um, um, the various cowpea strains, why the uh, West African rices the glabarimas in particular, survive in uh, so few numbers. One surviving strain in Martinique, uh, one surviving strain in Guinea among the 24 maroon rice varieties that have been preserved there along by uh, women rice cultivators uh, along the rivers there. And it turns out that it is just um, the epigenetics of glabarima just doesn't respond well to a different um, climactic environmental conditions. And in this regard, the tropical japonicas proved to be a much more resilient and portable rice. And indeed, you know, as, as long ago as 
a thousand years, um, rices that originated from Indonesia began to be adopted all over Africa. Same can be said of certain of the indica rices um, that uh, have proven equally um, transmissible. But neither the earliest glabarimas or the Madagascar white uh, survive into the 21st century. Now, gold seed rice uh, is a tropical japonica rice. Uh, genetically, it comes from South Asia. Uh, and uh, that being said, as I indicated before, this is a rice um, that had transit that was planted outside of its native island of Sulawesi, um, probably in Africa and certainly in various places in North America. In South Carolina, it was first planted in Pineville Plantation um, in Berkeley County um, by Hezekiah Mayhem, uh, who was next officer from um, Francis Marion's brigade. And he was an extraordinary character. Indeed, he, his personality was fictionalized in uh, the character of Captain Porgy in a whole series of revolutionary war novels written by the 19th century novels, uh, novelist William Gilmore Sims. Um, this golden hulled uh, rice with a wonderful starchy mouthfeel, a non-aromatic, uh, relatively prolific, was immediately adopted uh, by local planters. And by 1800, it was so popular that when Thomas Jefferson attempting to diversify her crops being planted in the United States secured a gift of uh, 100 plus Philippine varieties of Asian rice. Um, there was entire disinterest on the part of the local planters in, in diversifying. Uh, Carolina gold rice uh, was, was planted uh, in water impoundments and it required immense labor uh, and uh, extraordinary know-how know in terms of hydraulics uh, to maintain it. And um, the knowledge that uh, West African uh, rice growing slaves uh, had was essential to its establishment as an international commodity. In uh, the uh, 1830s, a spork or mutant strain with long grains was discovered on Brook Green Plantation. And it was this long grain variety um, that uh, for the period 1843 to 1861 became uh, the the famous um, variety of Carolina gold that was um, winning the gold medals in the uh, London Exhibition of 1851 and the Parisian Exposition of 1856 and commanded the highest price in the world rice market uh, in the later 1850s that was in Paris and was imported by the Chinese and, and exported from South Carolina to India by uh, the British to improve rice strains there in breeding. It became extinct during the Civil War. Uh, because um, rice is like Carolina gold and long gold required extraordinary 
economic resources and extraordinary labor resources to uh, engage in profitably, uh, it automatically excluded the bulk of uh, the population from cultivating it. Uh, so um, there was a movement in the 18th century and, and Jefferson himself is a very strong spokesman. He operates in the hilly Western part of Virginia, which doesn't have the flat uh, tidal rivers that can um, water um, rice fields. He becomes interested in upland rices. He knows that in Cochin China, as in Vietnam, for instance, there were upland rice varieties that were grown on hills and they could be grown as a garden plant. They were dry cultivated. So there was a huge push at the end of the 18th century to secure upland rice varieties so that small farmers could grow uh, these varieties. And there was a shipment of uh, an upland rice variety that came out of West Africa in the 1780s that came into Jefferson's hands and he distributed it throughout the Southeast. And uh, it became grown particularly in Georgia. And here we have a photograph of uh, um, a dry culture upland rice uh, field in North Georgia. Wormslow Plantation was a great center of upland rice culture and it had both the Cochin variety and, uh, and the red bearded rice. Uh, this red bearded rice was apparently recognized by uh, enslaved Africans in Georgia and adopted as a patch rice. Uh, and um, when the War of 1812 came around and the British came recruiting, numbers of African Americans joined the British Army. They, they became Royal Marines uh, with the promise of manumission and, um, and land to fight against their former masters. And lo and behold, in 1816, the British fulfilled that promise and took a, a group of, um, of these Royal Marines and their families and uh, settled them in Southern Trinidad. And these, um, these uh, fighters um, took with them the plants that they were growing in Cumberland, including the red bearded or upland rice. And there it was called Maruga Hill rice. And the people who cultivate it call themselves the Americans. Um, and in 2016, uh, Chef B.J. Dennis and I went to Trinidad and encountered the seventh generation descendant of one of those Royal Marines. Here is John Elliott growing on a hilltop in outside of Prince's Town in Trinidad, uh, an almost ripe field of Maruga Hill Rife. Uh, we had the genetics done on this and uh, by Michael Peruginen and Amy Lawton Raw. And it turns out that these are indica rices or, or combinations of indica and japonica rices. There, there's no glabarima in it. So this is an African derived rice that uh, his genetics comes from another part of the world. So it's suggested that the uh, global reach and transmission of, of rices is uh, something of long standing and, uh, and extraordinary stages of, of development. Um, there was a second upland rice 
uh, that was important in our region. And we've brought this back into cultivation in the last two years. It was first recorded in 1876 uh, by uh, Dr. P. Pritchard of Beaufort, South Carolina. Uh, and it came out of um, the West Indies. Uh, you can see it has broad flat grains. And um, like many patch rice farmers, it was used primarily for feed. It proved to be an extraordinary feed for fowls. If you were growing chickens, there was nothing better than this and mulberries in terms of uh, chicken feed. So I wanted to give you a, a kind of overview of rice varieties that's sort of different from these, you know, the usual uh, tourist brochure uh, and talk a little about the genetics uh, of the history of the rices that have been grown here. We're still growing rice and still consider it the center of South Carolina cuisine. There are other types of uh, grains grown uh, barley, you know, important in brewing, um, was originally uh, derived from a northern, real far north, the Orkney Islands in, in uh, Scotland was a, a home of it, and brought into the colonies in um, the middle of the 18th century, Thomas, uh, well, George Washington grew bear barley on uh, Mount, Mount Vernon. And what happened was in Scotland, it was a summer crop, but uh, Virginia proved too warm. So they started planting as an overwinter crop. And of course they had very little success, but the few plants that did survive, they collected seed from and turned it in after really draconian seed selection into an overwinter cold tolerant six row barley variety, which came to be known as winter barley. And this was the original barley for brewing, for feed, uh, for making into uh, barley breads like the Bannocks that are classic. Uh, and, and, uh, and one of the things that happens is that six row winter barley becomes locally adapted all across the South. And uh, um, in the early 20th century, uh, Tennessee, uh, Tennessee Experimental Station, decided to collect all of the be best locally adapted strains of six row winter barley and create a super strain, which they called Tennessee winter barley. And this uh, has these long awns that protect it from the birds. Uh, has been, you know, the default barley in the South for much of its history. And it's still grown in substantial numbers in places as a, a finishing feed for hogs. We also had a rye variety that was distinctive to uh, South Carolina. This was seashore black seed rye, and this may be the very first rye brought into the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it's extraordinarily heat tolerant. Uh, and uh, it, it, as you see in the little rye berries in the package there, it's, it's kind of dark. It's tall growing and it survived in the South uh, into the 21st century because of the quality of its straw. It was often planted as a cover crop and the straw operated as a wind barrier. If you were growing along the coastal zone and were worrying about sand being blasted into your tomato fields, uh, you grew a barrier of this uh, rise uh, as protection. And um, it's actually quite tasty. Um, rye crust, um, apple pies, and rye pancakes, rather than rye bread, was the way that it was often used, there was also a rye porridge that was consumed and not so popular now, but um, rye crackers uh, have retained their sort of hold on, on people's tongues. Uh, Marsh Hen Mill uh, has this rye available if you want to go with it. Uh, it's different than the 
uh, Eastern European ryes, which dominate in like uh, New York City rye breads, distinctive to us, a signature ingredient. I want to leave by thinking about something that we've not found that once was very important. Everyone knows about rye whiskey, but very few people ask what sort of rye was used in the original rye whiskey that made rye whiskey famous. And it turns out that um, there was this long white variety of rye called white mammoth or Egyptian rye that was brought into the United States um, in 1811 by the diplomat and poet James Barlow. He had been the ambassador uh, to Russia. Uh, he was in France and he secured seed for this extraordinarily large headed white rye. Uh, somehow it got uh, renamed as Egyptian rye, uh, but it was planted throughout the South and particularly in Kentucky. And it became the rye whiskey rye until prohibition. And all of a sudden the seed discipline falls apart in the South for it because uh, Revenuers and other people are on particular lookout for it. It survives, uh, interestingly enough, in the upper Midwest and finally in Canada. And the last known planting of it was in 1990. But I've been trying to find it uh, in the refrigerators of, um, of grain breeders in Canada. And it seems to have vanished off the place of this earth. I've got distillers lined up 10 deep who want white mammoth or Egyptian rye if it is ever found. So friends, this is the one treasure that was a signature that has been lost and it is greatly desired. So keep your eyes open. And uh, if you find some, Stick the seed in your refrigerator immediately to preserve its viability and contact me or the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation and we will ensure that uh, you will benefit from uh, the recovery of the seed that the distilling industry is so interested in. Well, friends, it's been good to talk with you today about, uh, about uh, these uh, the signature grains and cereals connected with South Carolina. Uh, and I hope that sometime in the future we can meet face to face and we can engage in a robust exchange of seeds or something like that. Uh, be well, be wise, take care. <laughs>